Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. In this video, I'm gonna be continuing a response to a good friend, Sifi, Sifi Talk. Sifi Talk, Sifi Talk, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call you Sifi. Sifi Talk, as this guy has been producing a lot of videos, a lot of content, bashing Christianity in the Bible, and I wanna demonstrate how hypocritical, hypocritical? I wanna demonstrate how hypocritical that is because he doesn't understand that these same issues are present in the Quran or the Sunnah to an even higher level, which for the Islamic perspective is an issue because you hold to the view that all the prophets are sinless. Christians, however, do not hold to the view that all prophets are sinless. And hence for us, this isn't an issue, but for Muslims, it is an issue. And the irony is, is the more Muslims try to bash Christianity by talking about some of the stories about prophets and how they have done sinful things, they in turn ridicule themselves because the Sunnah in particular says that the prophets did tons of sinful things, or at the very least, embarrassing, defaming, and things not worthy of a prophet. Let's take a look. Lies about the prophets of God. The prophets of God are human beings chosen by God Almighty and trusted to convey his message to us. And I want you to imagine the Pope who is revered and respected by Catholic Christians, running around naked for three years. Would you think this guy is sane and is trusted to learn anything about God from him? Of course not. And this is exactly what the Bible says about the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 20 verse 2 to 3. At that time the Lord spoke by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from your waist and take off your sandals from your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, how can a prophet be naked for three years and teach the word of God? Were there no children or women there? This story can't be from God and can't be true. And one of the strangest verses in the Bible is this. Ezekiel 4 verse 12. Eat the food as you would a loaf of barely bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. Using what? Human excrement? But why? Ezekiel 4 verse 13. The Lord said, In this way the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. And Ezekiel was confused and told God that he never had any impure food. Ezekiel 4 verse 14. Then I said, Not so sovereign Lord, I have never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. So did God have mercy on his prophet and abrogated the command to use human excrement as fuel? Of course not. Ezekiel 4 verse 15. Very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. So now it's cow dung and not human excrement. Who in his right mind believes such commands to be from God Almighty? It is very strange to claim this is from God Almighty. It doesn't make any sense. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Sifi has an issue with the fact that Isaiah was naked. This is evidently not possible. Why? Because the prophets would never be disgraced in such a way as to be made to be naked in front of other people. It's just not possible. Clearly this is a sign that the Bible has been corrupted. Alhamdulillah. Unfortunately, Sifi has not done his homework. And when I say homework, I kind of just mean he hasn't read his own sources. He isn't very familiar with his own religion. For example, we read in Sahih al Bukhari 278. Narrated Abu Huraira. The prophet said, the people of Bani Israel used to take bath, used to take bath, used to take baths naked altogether, looking at each other. The prophet Moses used to take a bath alone. They said, by Allah, nothing prevents Moses from taking a bath with us, except that he has a scrotal hernia. So once Moses went out to take a bath and put his clothes over a stone, and then that stone ran away with his clothes. Hmm... Yeah, I'm starting to notice a problem here. Moses followed that stone saying, My clothes, O stone, my clothes, O stone. So the people of Bani Israel saw him and said, By Allah, Moses has got no defect in his body. Moses took his clothes and began to beat the stone. He's now beating a stone with his own clothes while naked. Okay. Abu Huraira added, By Allah, there are still six or seven marks present on this stone from that excessive beating. Well, must have been a very intense beating by Moses while he was naked with his clothes 
on that stone. Now, what I want to focus on here is the part that says, O stone, till the people of Bani Israel saw him and said. In other words, the people of Israel saw Moses running naked, furiously after a stone, holding some clothes, trying to whip the stone with his clothes to punish the stone for stealing his clothes and running away with it, making Moses the subject of humiliation and embarrassment as he reveals his naked body to all of the people of Israel. And we can really big this up, by the way, because let's think about it. He's running through Israel, he's naked, so he's got his private parts out, he's a prophet, he's one of the most revered prophets, in all Abrahamic religions, including Islam. And given that the text doesn't distinguish between any groups or many places, it's safe to say this was public, and it's safe to say that includes women and children who also saw him naked. Whoops. By having an issue with Isaiah being naked, you immediately put yourself in a very dangerous position of condemning your own religion, because the sooner in Sahih al-Bukhari, one of the greatest and most trustworthy hadith collectors, it makes it clear that, indeed, Moses was also naked in front of many, many people, and doing humiliating, embarrassing, and completely unworthy things, like running through people, crowds of women and children and men in Bani Israel, while trying to whip a stone with some clothes. Not befitting of Moses, but Islam says it anyway. Okay, but that was Moses, that was Musa, that was one prophet. It's not as if there's going to be any other prophets in Islam who have been running around naked and embarrassing themselves and acting in ways that are shameful and defaming for a prophet, right? Right? Let's take a look. In Sahih al-Bukhari 364, we read. Actually, I just want to point out the, uh, the chapter title. It is disliked to be... <laughs> My gosh, guys, can you please translate this properly? Like, this, this is your... This is your religious texts. At least give the decency to translate it properly. It is disliked to the naked during Asalat, the prayers. So I assume that means it's disliked to be naked. Wait, it's only disliked. What, as in like it's just not preferable? <laughs> if if if, uh, if Abdul or, or Muhammad or Omar comes to uh, comes to the prayer in the mosque on a Friday and he's naked, mm, it, it's disliked. You know, we, we prefer it if he did put some clothes on. You know, when you bow down, the guy behind you doesn't like it so much. Anyway, narrated Jabir bin Abdullah, while Allah's messenger was carrying stones, along with the people of Mecca for the building of the Kaaba, wearing an Izzah, a way sheet cover, his uncle Alaba said to him, Oh, my nephew, it would be better if you take off your Izzah and put it over your shoulders underneath the stones. So he took off his Izzah and put it over his shoulders, but he felt unconscious, and since then he had never been seen Naked. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there were points in Muhammad's life when he was publicly seen naked by many people. Again, this is a public event, judging by the context. This is happening around the Kaaba. And again, an izar is a waist cover, so by removing that, his lower waist, i.e. his private parts, would have been visible. And the final sentence, he felt unconscious, so he is just lying there in public with his bits out for everyone to see. And this is at the Kaaba. This would have been a very public event. So again, men, women, and potentially children would have seen this. That is not befitting of a prophet, according to you. Therefore, you are dismantling, piece by piece, your own religion, or at the very least, the Sunnah that is the most trustworthy accounts that you have from al-Bukhari. But hey, if you want to keep making fun of the Bible, we will continue to show you how your own doctrines, your own beliefs, and your own texts absolutely demolish you. Just for reference as well, there was a notorious and iconic and infamous debate that happened at Speaker's Corner a long time ago, I don't know, a few years ago now, between Paperboy and Hashim. Paperboy being the Christian debater, Hashim being the Da'i from the Islamic perspective. Paperboy actually got Hashim to say on camera that it is inappropriate and wrong for a prophet to be naked in front of people publicly. And he even said, it doesn't matter how long of a period of time it is, if he is naked in front of people, that is not befitting of a prophet, therefore that can't be true, so the Bible must be corrupted, in reference to Isaiah. But that's now, my point is, right? My point is, that's an assumption. But my point is, do you disagree with that? I don't find that logic in God instructing and forcing someone to walk naked for three years in order just to make a point. So what if it was like five, like ten minutes? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the time. If God wanted to tell someone okay. that this is what is going to happen to the Egyptians and Ethiopians, then he could have just told them. Okay. Why the need? 
to impose it upon a prophet of God yeah. to walk naked for three years. Okay. Paperboy patiently waits and then at the end of the debate shows him these authentic Sahih hadiths saying how Muhammad was naked and also how Musa was naked. And Hashim is so embarrassed he says, naked doesn't mean naked. And, hold on, hold on. Hashim, do you hold on, hold on. Do you understand when you're wearing an Iza, Iza is basically the part that covers the lower body. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Is it possible he wore something underneath? He said he was naked. Yeah, but naked doesn't no. mean naked. Naked. Okay. Oh. And that phrase to this day has been a source of embarrassment for the Dai team because they realize that their own representatives of Islam don't actually know the sources very well at all, to the point where when they make attacks on Christianity, they're actually just shooting themselves in the foot. Which, as you can imagine, to Christians, it's a source of hilarity, and we, uh, we enjoy this very much. But is that where it ends? Is it just these embarrassing naked hadiths about Musa and about Muhammad? Is that it? No. As you can imagine, given that there are thousands and thousands of hadith from the many different collections, there's actually a pretty large source of reference material that we have to comb through to see all the embarrassing and humiliating and defaming hadiths that talk about the prophets of Islam. Well, supposedly prophets of Islam. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2819, which apparently the chapter heading is, Who wishes to beget a son to send for jihad? How lovely. We read, narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's messenger said, Once Solomon, son of David, said, By Allah, tonight I will have sexual intercourse with 100 or 99, we're not quite sure, there's of a debate, women, each of whom will give birth to a knight who will fight in Allah's cause. And that, A, if Allah wills, but he did not say, Allah willing. Therefore, only one of those women conceived and gave birth to a half man. By him in whose hands Muhammad's life is, if he had said, Allah willing, he would have begotten sons, all of whom would have been knights striving in Allah's cause. So the son of David, Solomon, according to this hadith, which again is incredibly authentic, it's in the most trusted sources of hadith, he said he was going to have sex with 99 or 100 different women. The plausibility of this is immediately in question, but hey, let's go with it. He's going to do this, perhaps it's a miracle, but he forgets to say inshallah or Allah willing. And because he forgets to do that, instead of all these knights of Islam, the mujahideen, the, the ones who will go out and will do great jihad for Allah's cause, instead of sons being given to him that would do this, he instead only got a half man half. Actually, it doesn't say what the other half is. It just says it's a half man. Maybe, I don't know, but it's just half of a man. And all because one of the prophets of Islam forgot to say inshallah. Does that sound humiliating for Solomon? I would say yes, that's very humiliating. Apparently Solomon had one of his women that he slept with give birth to half a man. You know, he wasn't even able to produce a lot of sons that would give their lives in jihad for Allah because he just couldn't remember to say a phrase. Kind of demeaning and belittling Solomon, don't you think? Evidently, this is belittling and demeaning prophets. Not a problem in Christianity. We don't think they're sinless. Massive problem in Islam because you think they're sinless and you think that Allah would only do things to a prophet that he is befitting of. Hence why people like Sifi and people like Hashim have issues with Isaiah being naked, not realizing Muhammad's naked. And yeah, so was Musa in their tradition. Let's go to another one. We read in Sahih Muslim 2841 the following. Allah the exalted and glorious created Adam in his image. Now that sounds very suspiciously like Genesis, but we'll let that slide for now. With his length of 60 cubits. To give context, this is exactly how tall 60 cubits is. Roughly around 27 meters. The average human, you could say, is somewhere around 2 meters. So you're looking at more than 10 times the size of today's average human being. Anyway, going back to the Hadith. And as he created him, he told them to greet that group. And that was a party of angels sitting there. And listen to the response that they gave him before it would form his greeting and that of his offspring. He then went away and said, peace be upon you. They, the angel said, may there be peace upon you and the mercy of Allah. And they made an addition of mercy of Allah. So he who would get into paradise would get in the form of Adam, his length being 60 cubits. Then the people who followed him continued to diminish in size up to this day. In other words, according to this narration, Adam was 27 meters when he was made. And since that time, humanity has been decreasing in size. Right, okay, so, <laughs> no, like that, <laughs> no, that's obviously nonsense. Humanity has not been decreasing in size since the time of Adam. Humanity has been increasing in size. We know from science, basic observation, I mean, it's not even, it's not even controversial, that 
a person's diet is one of the largest contributing factors to their size. Keep in mind, by the way, that wouldn't this mean that Aisha could have been taller than me, maybe? I mean, if people have been decreasing ever since Adam, and Aisha was 1,400 years ago, maybe Aisha was just super tall. But if Aisha's, if Aisha's super tall, then I guess Muhammad could have been super tall. In fact, he would have had to have been taller. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this leads to just anti-intelligent, <laughs> ignorant, false, laughable statements that are not valid at all. Keep in mind, by the way, that this talks about the length of Adam. It doesn't talk about the width of Adam. If you want to get pedantic here, maybe he's just a really tall, like, stick kind of guy who's 27 meters tall and, like, normal width. It also doesn't talk about Eve. Was she that tall? I mean, you would think it kind of implies that, so I guess so. Evidently, this, well, either it's not meant to be taken literally, it's metaphorical language, or it's just really, really wrong. And remember, the Sunnah, the most authentic Sunnah, is affirmed in the Quran, so this is revelation to you. You can't avoid this. The only way you can do it is by saying, well, actually, our scholars have been wrong about how we preserve hadith. If you go down that line, it's going to be a world of hurt for you. And lastly, one final hadith, because there are many... Muslims who are intelligent and they use their brains and they go searching for the hadith, they read these things, they study them and they come to the obvious conclusion that it's all nonsense. And one of the things they take issue with is a description about Aisha. Of course, there's the whole Muhammad had sex with her when she was nine years old. Obviously, they have issue with that and that's one of the big things that leads them away from all this stuff. But there's another hadith that they take a lot of issue with. Let's have a look. We read in Sahih al-Bukhari 3104, and this is the chapter, The Houses of the Wives of the Prophet, narrated Abdullah. The Prophet stood up and delivered a sermon, and pointing to Aisha's house. Now keep in mind, they add brackets in here to insert words into the text because they are familiar with this hadith, and they don't really like it. So they add a few words, but let's read it without the added words. The Prophet stood up and delivered a sermon, and pointing to Aisha's house, he said thrice, affliction, here, and from where the side of the Satan's head comes out. So pointing at Aisha's house, he says, affliction here, from where the side of Satan's head comes out. It doesn't really seem to be honoring Aisha, seems to be implying that some pretty negative things by making an association with her house and Satan. Nonetheless, you can see the added words. They try and imply, oh, well, actually, he's just pointing eastwards, you know, ignore the chapter title, ignore traditionally how this is understood, ignore all that. He was just pointing to the east, and now he's saying, oh, it's going to appear from the east, not from Aisha's house in particular. Uh-huh, of course. These are the lengths that people have to go to, that scholars have to go to, to avoid embarrassment, because there are tons of Muslims who are online, and you can you can check their stuff, and I've, I've read a lot of their, their, uh, their critiques of the hadith, who are saying, we cannot accept the hadith, because it's so bad and it's so derogative, it's so humiliating, it's so vile. These are things that we cannot accept about our prophets and about those whom we venerate. How on earth are we meant to accept this? These, I think, are very good critiques, very good critiques. I think that the next step is to actually just to leave Islam and to accept that, well, if, the, if we can't trust the hadith, to can't trust the sunnah, the Quran tells us to follow the sunnah. So what on earth do we do? Well, Islam kind of told you the answer. It told you that there is another prophet of whom was sinless, of whom, according to the Islamic tradition, he performed miracles like speaking from the cradle and breathing life into clay birds. He did these things. He was sinless, according to the Quran. Surah 19, Ayah 19, describes him as holy or pure. Muhammad is never described that way, at least not in the Quran. Maybe you should look to who this Isa character is. Now, I'll give you a clue. His name's not Isa. His name is Jesus. Come back to him. And you don't have to deal with all this hadith, you don't have to deal with all these embarrassing stories. Rather, you get to affirm the full humanity of people. The prophets were just human, like us. They made mistakes, evidently. The only person who is sinless is God. I mean, it's evident, but, you know, Islam has these issues. Come to the Lord Jesus. God bless you all. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one.